<laughs> this is my dog, Casey. You know, educators have a saying that when the student's ready, a teacher will appear. Little did I know when I first met this beautiful little lab that she would become a teacher of mine of sorts. But she did. And I call her Mrs. Casey because it fits her so well. About six months ago, she's taken me on a journey, an educational journey that I could have never predicted. Casey's the most sweet, lovable little lab you'd ever find. When we first met her, my wife and I, those big brown eyes, that sweet puppy smell, we mel she melted us at first sight. But she's grown into a wonderful young dog of two and a half years old. There's not a bad bone in her body. She's just the sweetest dog we've ever had. And she's become an indelible part, an integral part of our family. And we do everything together. I take her everywhere I can, and any free moment I have, I take and I spend it with Casey, with my partner. So it was no surprise that I noticed when she jumped on my bed in October last year, and she appeared to hurt her hip and her, her left rear leg. It didn't seem like much at first, but after a couple of days of noticing her favoring that hip, my wife and I decided we should take her to the vet. So thinking maybe a pulled muscle, maybe just a tweak, but nevertheless, she is one of our family, and so uh, we needed to take a look at it. After about an hour, the veterinarian came out, sat us down, and said, I have some bad news for you. Your dog has cancer, bone cancer. And it has a particularly aggressive form of bone cancer called osteosarcoma. And the standard of care for osteosarcoma is we need to immediately remove her left rear leg at the abdomen. And then she's going to have to go into four months of chemotherapy. And then, at best, statistics say she has less than a 10% chance of living 300 days. Needless to say, my wife and I were devastated. It took us a few days to regain our composure, but because we had no other alternative, we decided to go ahead with the procedure and have Casey's leg removed. It was awful watching that sweet little thing struggle, trying to figure out what happened to her. But you know, I think she recovered from the surgery probably faster than we did uh, psychologically. But just watching her was an inspiration. And the chemotherapy, that was tough, too, but we watched her go through that because it was the only thing we could do and we felt it was the right thing to do. But you know, we sat back and said, we are not going to live with this 300-day sentence. There's got to be a better answer. I've always been interested in science and technology, and I am the chairman of the board of Dr. Lee Hood's Institute for Systems Biology. Dr. Lee Hood is, one, is a world-renowned researcher and geneticist. I'm also on Harvard Systems Biology Advisory Board, and I am the, one of the founders and the current chair of the Seattle Science Foundation. So I have a really interesting network of friends, researchers, and docs as a result. So my wife and I decided that we would go energize that network, sort of using that network to connect the dots, if you will. And we asked them to give us every paper they could on bone cancer and osteosarcoma, and more particularly canine osteosarcoma. Well, I got piles of papers, and my eyes hurt, but we knew Casey hurt. And it was the right thing to do. We plowed through those papers. And I know more now about osteosarcoma because of my teacher, Mrs. Casey, in a way, kind of drug me through this process more than I wanted to know. And lo and behold, my dog trainer's wife, 
came across an interesting clinical trial at UPenn in Philadelphia. Dr. Nicola Mason, who is an award-winning veterinarian, had a theory that she could take the Listeria bacteria, which is the bacteria that's common in food poisoning, and that she could genetically engineer that Listeria in a particular way, that when used as a vaccine, her words, that we could use it as a, and inject it into the bloodstream of our dog, and it would educate our dog's immune system in such a way that it would flood her system with cytokines, white blood cells, that had a particular target. They would kill this particular molecule that was instrumental in the signaling pathway of Casey's cancer. And if we could stop that signaling pathway, we could cure or at least stop and rid the cancer from Casey's body. The ramifications are obvious of this study. There's 17 dogs in her study, and Casey's now 18. The first 17 dogs in, of them, the first that got into the trial, are 700 days now, and they're cancer-free with this strategy. In fact, all the dogs in this trial are cancer-free. Casey's early on in this process, and she's only had two vaccinations. The regimen calls for three, but we're a bit exploring. And Casey's cancer-free, but her 300 days is up in August. But we're cautiously optimistic for Mrs. Casey. As I said, the ramifications are obvious. First success in this canine model, and then FDA approval and on to a human model. There's lots of opportunity and promise, but we're being cautiously optimistic here. But for an interesting confluence of events, my history, my interest in science, and Casey's cancer, I would have never learned this much about cancer or bone cancer, and I would have never found Dr. Nicola Mason at UPenn. But that important confluence of events has brought hope for Casey's life. You know, it's interesting that we sit here at another important confluence, and that is the confluence of the Wenatchee and the Columbia River. You know, the Columbia River has been bringing life to this community for thousands of years. Centuries ago, Native Americans wandered the banks of the Columbia River, and its waters brought them life. In the 30s, Grand Coulee Dam was built, and we lifted the waters up out of Grand Coulee, out of the reservoir, and up into Banks Lake, and we formed the headwaters of the Bonneville Irrigation District and we brought water to the deserts of central Washington and an agricultural industry that has produced enormous amounts of food that improve the lives of not only people here, but people around the world through exports. The energy in that river has also electrified rural Washington and improved the lives of the people in rural Washington. And that electricity also brought the aluminum industry here some decades ago. And the aluminum industry created jobs, and those jobs created tax dollars, and those tax dollars paid for our streets, paid for our schools, and paid for our hospitals. And as a result, all of our lives have been improved. But the energy in that river is bringing another industry here, and that's the data center industry. Look at this map. This is a map of bandwidth in the United States, with the deepest blue designating the fastest bandwidth. You see anything interesting on that map? <laughs> Gee. Part of it is our NOAA net, and people before us, our economic development people, that created that first network that kind of primed the pump. 
But the energy in the river is pulling these data centers here, and those data centers here are pulling massive bandwidth to this area, which gives us enormous connectivity. Data centers need two things. They need low-cost electricity, and they need enormous bandwidth. And this bandwidth is exceedingly fast. It costs a lot of money to move electrons or electricity through transmission lines for great distances. But it costs little to move photons or light through fiber optic networks. So data centers want to move closer to the source of electricity and then use these networks to broadcast information around the world. How fast? Near the speed of light. How fast? It takes us less than 120 milliseconds to move data round trip to Tokyo and back to data centers here in central Washington. It also takes 70 milliseconds, less than 70 milliseconds, to move data to New York and back. That is so fast, it's not humanly discernible. So what goes on in these near windowless buildings? I like to think they're the brain or the brains of the internet. If we didn't have those buildings, there would be no internet. Think about your PCs, your pads, your pods, your handhelds, and all of us are using those more and more every day. And so the demand for digital space continues to skyrocket. All that information is stored, transferred, transmitted, and switched through these facilities. But also, all of your credit cards, your financial information, your smartphones, and all your video is going through those facilities. But most important for me, and my situation with Casey, is the massive compute power that resides in those buildings is assisting researchers around the world, like Dr. Nicola Mason at UPenn, to find solutions to genetic diseases like my Casey's cancer. In fact, these data centers and medical health records and the medical world, the medical industry, is the largest user of data centers. And we're only in the earliest stages of the digitization of healthcare. As we move to a more personalized, predictive, and preventative world in healthcare, you're going to want to have your genome sequenced. And there's multiple terabytes of data in those sequences. And that information is going to be value, and it's going to need to be stored and be ready for interrogation so that we can prevent diseases like cancer from happening, because we can anticipate them. Let me give you an example of something that's going on right now. There's a consortium in New York of the 12 major medical research institutions, including Rockefeller University and Cold Springs Harbor, where the first DNA helix was first modeled. All of their sequencing of their patients, all the sequences of their patients, all that data is currently being shipped to data centers here in central Washington right now to be interrogated to find solutions for their genetic problems and to improve their lives. And this is just the beginning. Authors have used the metaphor rivers of life before. I think it's poetic in a way that this river, the Columbia River, is saving lives. That this river has a potential to play a part in the solution for complex genetic diseases like cancer. Think of a cancer-free world. Goethe, the poet, wrote, 
Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. This river is bold and it's improved our lives for hundreds of years. This river has the energy in it to improve our lives again. The question for us is, are we bold enough to seize the opportunity of the confluences that we have right now to improve our futures? I ask the question, can this river improve our futures again? Can this river be partly responsible for saving my Casey's life? Well, I hope so. I think so. But maybe we should ask my teacher, Mrs. Casey, what she thinks. Mrs. Casey. <laughs> this is my baby. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.